The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Wisconsin. In the early 80s, when cable television was just seeping onto our TV consoles, penetrating our minds and changing our viewing habits, we heard the cry from America's youth, I want my MTV. We'll meet one of the people who gave it to them. And yes, she knows Martha Quinn. Next, stay with us. It's uh, hard to remember when cable television and iPods weren't omnipresent, and people actually only watched three networks and only bought one vinyl record at a time. But an infant cable network set its sights on capturing the attention of young America, and in so doing, changed the course of music and culture in the United States and around the world. Sue Steinberg, a UW journalism graduate, was there when MTV was conceived and has had a hand in nurturing the cable industry into the colossal colossus it became. Sue, welcome back to Madison. Thank you good very you. much. It's good to be here. It feels good to be back. It feels great to it's be back. It's been a while. It, I would say so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about your life as a student and what brought mm -hmm. you here and everything. But let's talk a little bit about um, the rise of N MTV. Um, was there a moment, an epiphany that you had? You were one of a, a handful of people, five, six, seven people. I think you might have been the only woman on staff there for a while. Um, uh, just a handful of people. Was there an epiphany when you said, oh, my God, there's something going on here. This could be big. Was there a moment when you realized, what have we done? I don't think, I don't recall a single moment. I remember many moments um, throughout the infancy right. of the channel and the genesis of getting it ready to go on air. Yeah. Uh, there were moments where we thought it would be explosive and there were other moments where I thought, what have I done to my career? <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. will, you know, this could fade away and then what do I say I've done? Right. You came over from Nickelodeon I did. to MTV, right? Yes, I did. And it was all new stuff then. Nickelodeon was new. Very MTV new, was new. Very new. Um, what were the guiding principles of creating MTV? I mean, did you have a plan or was it just throw a video in the tape machine? Oh, the, it wasn't just throw a video in the tape machine. It was definitely a plan. And it, there were... There were several elements that were key in getting this started. First of all, um, MTV at the time was owned by a um, combination of Warner Communications and American Express. And um, there were so many video music videos right. just kind of in storage. Yeah, right, hanging because, there, right, unused content. Because Warner Communications was the parent company to Warner Brothers Records, right. Atlantic Records, Electra Asylum, and smaller labels under those, you know, umbrella labels. Right. So those videos were largely produced for uh, sales meetings hmm. when um, executives would go out and present new music to buyers right. for, and distributors. And after that, there was nothing to do with them. They right. sat around. And they were great. So Yeah, they occurred. were great. Yeah. You know, I, I want to talk to you about the original VJs mm -hmm. on MTV. But I have to say, one of the most interesting things about MTV is it spawned a whole generation of feature film directors. David Fincher, Spike yes. Jones, a lot of those guys got their mm -hmm. start doing MTV videos. Um, Martha Quinn, J.J. Jackson, Alan Hunter, Mark Goodman and, and Nina, Nina Blackwell. Blackwell. They were the five VJs. How did you select Excuse those? Excuse me. Oh, there were, me, was there more? It was no. It was Nina Blackwood. Blackwood. Sorry. sorry. Uh, she was she was a bit of a temptress. Martha Quinn was the girl next door. Right. Um, so how did you select these guys? Did you have your hand in that? Oh, I very much had my hand in that. Yeah. In fact, I did all of the casting. Yeah. Really. And yes. And. Um, I was kind of sweet on Martha Quinn. Well, everybody was. Really? I mean, yeah, Martha became a star, an overnight sensation. She was. Yeah. She was, she's smart. She was smart, She's too. a very smart girl. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's interesting and funny how Martha arrived there. Martha was working at, um, I think, NBC as an intern. Mm -hmm. And at the last minute, one of the VJs that we had hired dropped out. She just decided that she didn't really believe this thing was going to work. Of course. And uh, <laughs> she wanted, you know, security and in, where's her, that, in her radio where's job. Where's that person? Now? She's actually on Sirius Radio oh, okay. now. Yeah. And um, 
So it was 48 hours before launch. And we were, I was scrambling to find someone else. Yeah. And Bob Pittman called me up and said, uh, you know, everybody was making calls to four corners of the earth, it seemed. Right. And um, he called me up and he said, you know, there's this young girl who's working as an intern over at NBC Radio. And I've been told that we should see her. She came over. She was clearly adorable. Right. She really fit that bill of girl next door. Yep. She knew very little about music, but that's okay. We <laughs> yeah. could educate her. She was immensely likable. She was immediately likable. Right. And she was so young that she couldn't sign her own contract. Ah. Her father had to sign her contract for her. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so um, the early iterations of MTV mm -hmm. hit some speed bumps on the issues of treatment of women mm -hmm. and uh, presence of black artists mm -hmm. on the channel. Yes. Did you have to wade in on those issues? Because women were, uh, you know, rock and roll has forever objectified women. Mm -hmm. And there weren't a lot of black artists on MTV to start with. No. Those must have been interesting discussions. Well, they were interesting discussions. And um, one has to understand that the 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 point of MTV or the programming point of MTV was really to capture as much of that uh, there is a word for it that I don't remember um, not alternative but mm -hmm. um, you know rock and roll rock and roll right exactly audience as we could but what's little known or perhaps not remembered is that um, the saturation of cable affiliate, you know, most of the cable affiliates who were carrying MTV or determined that they would carry MTV in the very beginning mm -hmm. were not in urban areas. Right. So, um, which is where that music generally is popular. Sure. In addition to which, it was really at the very beginning right. of hip hop. Um, you know, urban music was largely soul music. Right. Still at the time. R&B. Right. Yeah. Um, there were a few huge artists like Prince, um, Michael, Michael Jackson. Right. Although Michael Jackson, that was kind of a different story yeah, altogether. Yeah, he kind of transcended. He transcended genres, genres yeah, exactly, yeah. and because he produced such elaborate videos, right. that it was impossible to well, ignore. Well, and he was kind of a breakthrough artist for MTV with the yes. beaded video and everything. When we get back, let's talk mm -hmm. about that. And I want to, I want to hear some backstage stories of the artists he had on set and everything, because I'm okay. sure you may have a few. Um, we're going to be right back with Sue Steinberg and uh, MTV stories. Stay with us. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. For more than 100 years, the University of Wisconsin has been inspired by the Wisconsin idea. Which says the good work of the university extends to the boundaries of the state and beyond. So the UW works hard to help build Wisconsin's economy. Educate people of all ages. Advance health and medicine. And enhance the quality of life for all of us. Hit it! The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. Hey, we're back in Madison with Sue Steinberg, UWJ School grad. Um, spent a good deal of her uh, youth here in Madison before going on to help uh, do, among other things, um, found MTV. Um, so uh, now let's flash forward to today. Um, I actually am a little bit of a veteran of the broadcast industry as well mm -hmm. and cable. Um, isn't the explosion of channels on the web now kind of reminiscent of the early days of MTV? There's kind of a similar phenomenon occurring? Well, actually, it goes back further than MTV. Yeah. Um, I remember when I first started working in the cable business, uh, you know, if you wanted to be in the television business, people didn't even know what cable television was. Right. It seemed and like it was care. public access. Yeah. That was it. And um, the original pay-per-view channels were HBO and then what we used to call blue channels. Uh -huh. And, um, you and know, those the blue cable... channels were our X-rated stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah. And this was before the Playboy channel. Right. I mean, there's softcore, there's hardcore. Right. You know, now you have your choice of everything and anything in the in the world, so it seems. Right. Um, but in the very beginning, I worked for, in a test market situation for Warner Communications, Warner Cable. And uh, at the time... Was that Q or whatever? Yeah, it was Cube. Called? Cube, yeah. yeah Cube, it was sure. just test marketed in Columbus, Ohio. Gotcha, sure. I, and know, I know someone who's talent there then. I... Um, 
it allowed viewers to determine for themselves how they wanted to program the day. Now, it was very raw, yeah. and it was very basic, but I think that it set the stage for what we now know as the Internet, where you could really make choices, you could affect the outcome. Um, well, you it's know, consumer controlled as exactly, opposed to media as, bearers yeah, saying, exactly. here's what we think you should watch or exactly. what we think you'll like. Right. Um, yeah, what, you know, that's what I would say is extrapolating what you learned at the cutting edge of cable mm -hmm. to what's happening now on the web. What lessons do you think are there? You know, it's like, because uh, similar to you, I feel a little deja vu with all of this mm -hmm. happening. And there are some predictable things within oh, the context absolutely. of this. Absolutely. I think that without cable, the, the beginnings of cable television, I'm not so sure that the internet would exist. I think that technology would be there, but I don't know that w it would have been formed in the same way. I think that's a fair argument. I, I think that, um, you know, looking back, because I was there. I, you know, mm -hmm. I can lay claim to having watched this all, uh, you know, to being there for the genesis, you know, the beginning of it, watching it grow. And um, I think that once the media turned its eye toward the consumer versus the programmer, mm -hmm. then it opened up the world for everything and anything. And a lot of it was uh, advertising dictated. Well, and you know, that's the interesting thing. MTV was the first profitable cable channel. There are similar um, financial things happening now. People are wondering, how do you monetize the web? How do you pay for things? Mm -hmm. Newspapers are going away. Everything's given away for free. People worry about accountability of information. Um, how do you think the web will end up being monetized? Because cable, for a while, no one f f could figure out the economic model for that as well. Well, actually, I would argue that because, in fact... Very early on, advertising-driven? Yeah, advertising-driven, it, advertising driven. But exactly. But cable originally was promised as TV without commercials. There were channels that were TV that existed as TV without commercials. Nickelodeon was one of them. Right. Um, a lot. That lasted you know, like a week. Well, a little <laughs> bit longer than a I week. Know. I mean, these channels had to prove themselves. Right. Um, you know, long came CNN. That was one of the later, or you know, one of the next generation yes. of 24-hour cycle television. So, how do you think they'll monetize the web? I, it's very difficult, and somebody will come up with the answer, some smart person. There are sites that are making money. Yeah. I know Google is making money, and that's advertiser run. Right. Um, but I think that as the web evolves and uh, further narrowcasts the way that cable did, yes. really finds very specific niche um, sites, niche uh, Audiences, channels, yeah. so to speak. Communities, Audience, actually. Yeah, about exactly, communities. about communities now. Then um, the advertisers will follow because advertisers need to make sure that their dollars go specifically toward their viewers. To, to where there are eyeballs. Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. you look at Animal Planet, for example, right. You know, what do you see? You see dog food commercials. Right. You see, yeah. you know, things that are relevant to and, watchers. That and are, you know, they're not spending money putting up Chevy truck ads for someone who would never buy a Chevy truck. Exactly. I mean, it should, could or should be more efficient for mm -hmm. advertisers. Yes. Um, when we come back, I want to find out how you went from Stroudsburg, PA, to Madison, Wisconsin, okay? Okay. How'd you make that decision? We'll be right back with Sue Steinberg, who just happened to help invent MTV. We'll be back. We will, okay, we will. I'd like to. Uh, we're back with Sue Steinberg. We're here in Madison. Sue's a UW um, J School grad, helped found MTV. And you're back in Madison for the first time in a decade or yeah, two. How's exactly. that? How's That's that? Good. Is that That's artfully good. done? Yeah. Um, so, how did you come to Madison? Stroudsburg, PA, you know, smart girl. And you picked up and you came to Madison, Wisconsin. How did that happen? What? Yeah. Well, actually, I went from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, which is a very or at least at the time, was a very tiny town sure. in the Pocono Mountains. And um, as much as it seems like the Outback, or did then, it was not so far away from New York City. Gotcha. So I had a sense of culture and a bigger world out there. Right. My parents sent me to, well, I should say I went to, a girls' private boarding school outside of Boston, which was a very sheltered, closed... La -da. Yeah, closed <laughs> environment. And um, I don't know how much la-di-da was in that, but um, uh, it was a good education, and, um, but a very small environment, all girls at the time. And uh, after that, I wanted a completely different experience. And 
you know, I wanted a co-ed experience. I wanted a big campus. I was not interested in a small liberal arts college. And I wanted to get away from the East Coast, not because I didn't love it, but because I just wanted to see something else. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time, people my age did a lot more of that roaming around, so right. to speak, yeah. or desire to experience something else. And, um, you know, perhaps not, I don't know, because I don't know what uh, young students are really looking for in their college experience now. But in my, in my time, in my generation, when I went to college, people really wanted different experiences. And, did and I got did, it here. Yeah, I was going to say, let me I, see, co-ed, I was yeah, very co-ed, exactly. it was big. Um, what, how did the UW-Madison experience change you or inform your view of the world that you still carry with you today? Oh, I think it changed my view of the world uh, completely. It was, uh, first of all, the education was really terrific. Mm -hmm. It was a great education. And it was a lot more difficult, a lot more stringent than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. I, um, I played hard, but I studied hard. That's and a little bit of the, yeah, the reputation. Here. That was the yeah. ethic. Right. And um, also, I think that being in the Midwest is a very, the Midwest is a very special place. Yeah. And I think that when the New York, Los Angeles press media characterizes the Midwest, it's all wrong. Right. I concur. I really think that the Midwest has so much and the people are very special and wonderful and warm and welcoming and um, it's a different profile and I think well, it informed me a lot. Well you get a different lot. view of the country from here and you know I don't very think it's so. happenstance having worked in Chicago in, in, for ABC and CBS, Oprah, mm -hmm. Siskel and Ebert, right. Phil Donahue, there's a lot, there's been a lot of successful Jerry Springer. Ha. Um, there's been a lot of successful broadcasting done out of Chicago looking mm -hmm. both ways. Right. And there's a voice that comes from the Midwest that I think is a valuable one. And, and uh, what I, I guess what I would ask is um, how did, you know, Madison was um, a progressive campus. And, you, and politics in Wisconsin absolutely. were progressive. And that was very much part of what I absolutely. took Absolutely. And feminism was, it was oh, very, uh, moving yeah, up absolutely. the agenda after the war was mm -hmm. kind of winding down. Mm -hmm. um, how did that inform your work at MTV? Because rock and roll is all about boys and girls. Well, rock and roll has always had that reputation. Right. And there were a lot of powers that be that would say, you know, when you bring up the issue of objectifying women or feminist uh, tendencies or or ideas, not tendencies, mm -hmm. but ideas. Right. And women in cages. Future, right? Future, you know, looking to the future, and wondering, have we learned nothing? You know, there are so many. There've been so much, so many books written about the progression of women in the world, and to some degree, to a great degree, uh, rock and roll seems stuck in time. Right. But there was a view that, oh, it's only rock and roll, is that, you know, right. this is what it is, this is what it will always be. And I always questioned why. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's good, a you progressive know, art form. I don't know. It bothers me that Mick Jagger's still prancing around. I mean, as if he is really sexy. Mm -hmm. It's kind of pathetic. I mean, my opinion. But, you know, whatever. Um, so when we come back, I want to talk about when you went from New York to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is another bastion of male um, dominance. Absolutely. Right. Tough, tough business for women tough. at that time. So yeah. when we come back, let's talk about okay. that, okay? Great. We'll be right back with Sue Steinberg. Yeah, I have a hard time. Um, we're back with Sue Steinberg, UW J School grad. We're here in Madison, Wisconsin. You're back after a decade or two. Um, so you left the male-dominated world of rock and roll on MTV, and you wanted to change of pace, so you went to Hollywood. Uh, I'm tongue in cheek. That also That's an interesting place, place for a young right. woman to be right. at that time in, say, the 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. Actually, well, it was the mid 80s actually when you got out there. Um, you went to work for Sony. I did. Yeah. I did. I, I first went to work for a production company yeah. called Goober Peters, which was later acquired by Sony. Right. And I went there primarily. Um, Peter Goober and John Peters. That's right. That's right. Who went on to become co-chairman of Sony. Right. And um, produced mega blockbuster films but like Batman. started out as Batman. Barbara Streisand's. Well, Paris John Master. did. John right. did. Yeah. But he was a, he was and is a very very. Um, 
very smart guy. Yeah. And he knew what to do with her career, too. Yeah. And um, he's actually the one who started the conversations going with Sony. Really? He was just, uh, you know, he was a real um, maverick. He, yeah. he just had his own way, his own pace. And um, I don't know that the corporate world was quite right for him, but he certainly had great ideas. What did you learn in um, Hollywood that you hadn't learned in New York? Well, I really went to Hollywood to, um, not so much for a change of pace, although I did go, the weather factored in very well, mm -hmm. but um, I went there to, because I wanted to grow into long form television right. and fiction television. And so when I went there, I did TV movies, which was then a viable business, right. and miniseries, right. which you basically don't see anymore nope. unless you're watching uh, Lifetime television for women mm -hmm. or um, maybe Soapnet. Right. Um, you know, it was a, it was a, they were targeted, those, those programs were targeted toward women. Right. There's always, you know, women in jeopardy mm -hmm. or romantic novels. Like, Foreign birds and... Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Anything by Judith Krantz. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and then when did you leave Hollywood? I left Hollywood, um, well, physically I left only a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. But I left that end of the business, I would say, in the... Mid nineties. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you're a smart girl from Madison. You know, mm -hmm. and PA, and you were in. You know, I don't mean to overemphasize the the gender issue here, mm -hmm. but did you find yourself a lot of times whispering in guys' ears, just saying, "Hey, you sound like an idiot." You know, did you did, were you a nudge sometimes on that? No, I was a nudge on other things. Oh, well, what were you I a nudge was, on? Um, I was a nudge about, you know, I think that being a woman in that business, you really had to go a greater distance. You had right. to work twice as hard. Right. You had to uh, cajole. And Are you angry about that? No, not at all. It's just what you have to do. Right. It's what you have to do to get by, what you have to do to survive, and then next level, what you have to do to really succeed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very happy that I was of a generation to lay a groundwork for a generation of women now who have it perhaps a little bit better. Do you think, I watch Mad Men on mm -hmm. AMC with my right. daughters, and they scream out loud at some of the scenes mm -hmm. where how women are treated. Mm -hmm. And I go, you guys, I can remember that vividly when mm -hmm. you know a boss would comment on a woman's bus line in front of everyone in a mm -hmm. meeting or something like that. I said, I'm sorry, I'm old enough to actually remember that. And it, you know, in the day seemed normal, and now it's, you know, oh, it's just amazing. You would go report that person, right? and yeah. there would be a harassment case. Right. But all of that changed with Anita Hill, so that will, yeah. you know, test everybody's memories. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, that certainly existed, but somebody had to bring it to light. Right. And it was, I think that it was specifically at that pr particular time in our general society. Yeah. You know, uh, unfortunately for her, or fortunately for her, she is, um, the poster if you child. will, yeah. she's the Rosa Parks yeah. of the right. women's movement, you know. Um, what piece of work, I'm sorry, I didn't mean That's to okay. What piece of work are you most proud of? Boy, I'm really pretty much proud of all of my career. Good I'm very you. proud of MTV. Yeah. I'm very proud of what it has become, the tremendous success internationally. Um, the biggest brand of yeah. the last um, century, right. the last millennium. Um, um, we're going to come back. Mm -hmm. You moved back to New York. I want to find out why. Okay. And um, we're going to take some questions, too, I hope, okay. if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Great. We'll be right back with Sue Steinberg. Um, hey, we're back with Sue Steinberg here in Madison. Um, I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. You left L.A. to go. You live now in the um, Hudson River Valley in New York. That's right. Why? I had left the um, entertainment business mm -hmm. in the, uh, my, my, my swan song in the entertainment business was a show, a primetime show on Fox called The Ultimate Challenge. Mm -hmm. It was in the earlier days, not the beginning days, but earlier days of reality programming. Sure. And this was a, a show that focused on stunts. Right. So I was the executive producer, and my days were spent with guys who did car tricks and right. chases and high jumps and, you know, bursting through windows and, you know, all of that. Um, after that, I thought, you know what, I want to change it up a bit. Mm -hmm. 
partly because of what I was interested in, and partly because women in the business at that time, and I think still today, have a much shorter shelf life. So you really do have to be looking out for your future. Mm -hmm. From there, I segued into some marketing jobs. And my last job in Los Angeles was, I, I started a consulting business. And I consulted for some magazines. I consulted at Condé Nast Publishing in New York. And I consulted for an interesting company that was a, an architectural glass products company. Right. And people would scratch their head and go, how did you get from point A to point B there? But I was approached because I, didn't ha because I had an unorthodox background. Sure, it was an asymmetrical exactly, notion. Exactly, exactly. Right? But in truth, if you can produce sequentially, and that's yeah. what television production is, you can take that skill anywhere. And also make quick aesthetic decisions. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and do things in what would have been an unorthodox way and a right. creative way. After that, um, I simply didn't need to be in Los Angeles anymore. Right. And Los Angeles is really an industry town. Right. And once you're not in that in industry, I guess it's analogous to the to new technology in the way that you don't have to be anywhere right. as long as you have a phone and a computer and a fax machine which right. is now a dated piece of technology you can really be living anywhere i have family on the east coast i'm from the east coast my heart has always been on the east coast so here's a question for you um we're contemporaries, I think. We're mm -hmm. kind of at Wisconsin at roughly the same time. Well, a few decades, yeah. yeah no, no, yeah. I mean, I mean, we're, we're both gone from Madison right, a few decades, exactly. right? Right, um, exactly. Uh, and you're in an interesting place in your life. You're one of the people who created the icon for the youth culture in America mm -hmm. and around the world in media with MTV. Yes. Um, you're not an adolescent anymore. Really? And, <laughs> and um, nor am I. But how do you view aging? Now, how do you view not being in that target demographic that you targeted so well during MTV? What, 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 what will boomers be able to teach following generations about aging? That's a great question. And um, in fact, I hope that boomers can teach following generations, younger generations, how to embrace their future. And I think that because my gener our generation was such a breakthrough generation, uh, we will work much longer. We will um, reinvent ourselves many more times than our we parents love the did. Attention. Well, we definitely love the <laughs> attention, but we've had to. I mean, yeah. economics have dictated that right. we have to make changes. And I think that what we will pass on is the ability to be nimble in your life, that there will be more, perhaps more than one career that you will be. And I think also what I never realized when I was young or never really thought about was that you'll be able to teach, mm -hmm. that you'll be, and we, we hear these, this little phrase, give back, give back. And, you know, to some degree it sounds like a little bit of a cliche and we don't really understand what it is until you arrive there, until you find your place, what makes you comfortable in giving back, whether it's becoming a, an instructor, a professor, a teacher, um, mentor, of any, yep. a mentor, exactly, or finding your way to that specific cause in life, which I think my generation was really all about. We were so much about causes, right. making the world a better place. Um, did I say bitter? I meant better, better. place, right? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, we were so entrenched in politics, and I think we still are, and. Um, so I think we pass that on. I think we pass on the notion that, or the idea, the reality, that you can stay younger, longer. Right. Um, you're going to get some questions from some students here. Great. I'm Speaking ready. Speaking of young. Yeah. OK, we're going to be right back with Sue Steinberg. Um, yeah, that's We're back with Sue Steinberg. We were just talking about if smog or earthquakes were a good metaphor for LA, uh, life in LA. But we're going to take some questions from our audience, which is comprised mostly of um, active students here in Madison. So what's the first question? Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Alex. My Hi. question is, is there any recent MTV projects or shows that you absolutely hate? Good question. That good question from a Wisconsin student, huh? That's a very thoughtful question. <laughs> it is. Um, I don't watch a lot of MTV now. I, I, I look in to see what's going on and how it's changed. 
but um, I, I have a problem with exposing people's lives to the degree where everybody looks like a fool. And I think that um, so much of MTV's programming turns the camera on people who really just want to be in front of a camera. And when I say, uh, I don't think that they're consciously looking to make fools of people. I think people are good enough at doing, them, <laughs> doing that for themselves. And not everybody on MTV looks like a fool. I didn't mean to, uh, to, to put that forth. But um, I think that uh, there's just a little bit too much reality and not enough fiction. And I think that fiction is really the stuff of imagination and the stuff that makes us move forward in our lives and makes the culture move forward. Alex, are there any shows on MTV you don't like? Quite a few, but I was actually um, going to do a little follow-up question. What did you think about MTV's college life here in Madison? Honestly, I never saw you it. You didn't see it. No. Yeah. Um, well, I'll give you some. Ba I'll give you some backstory. Um, it was a. It was a, a piece shot, very handheld, of uh, freshman year for a cross section of students, and um, it was produced by a, a grad. But um, there were some reactions to it that it, and it wasn't done under the aegis of the university. Mm -hmm. It was done. Um, they didn't back it, uh, but there was a lot of drinking and partying and soap opera type stuff, and a lot of there were some students who said that doesn't resemble my experience at all. So it was mm -hmm. kind of sensationalized. Well, duh. So much, yeah, exactly. You <laughs> know, you reality expect? programming is mostly sens sensationalized. It would be very boring to watch somebody who goes to classes, come ho comes home, studies, and you know maybe has a beer on the weekend. No, they want to see people who, uh, you know, to go who go to extremes mostly. But um, I would have to say that uh, you know anything that shines a light on people's reality. When I watch, when I watch MTV, I'm I was addicted for a while to The Hills. Um, but I lived in Hollywood, so some of that, I, see, I used to see that every day in a certain corner of the city. Um, I used to love uh, Cribs and... Uh, Pit My Ride? Pit My Ride. I was just going to say Pit yeah. My Ride. Um, I thought those were pretty clever, inventive shows. And I think the way they were packaged, you know, with hosts and... Um, a certain, and a hip sensibility. That is what MTV really is at its best. Can I throw one other one yes. in there? And I don't know if it's MTV or VH1, but it was this band reunion show that they did where this guy went out and sought out old bands that had been hits during the 80s on MTV mm -hmm. and hadn't talked to each other in 15 years because they had a falling out or they stopped selling records or anything. It was hysterical. And he, he, he made them commit to doing a reunion. Mm -hmm. It was very funny. And it was a wonderful snapshot in pop culture mm -hmm. as well. And it was also a very sad testimony about age. Because the guy who was in Flock of Seagulls, does, no one even here knows it, but they, this guy had huge hair. He's now very meaty, beefy, big, and bouncy mm -hmm. and doesn't have a lot of hair. It was pretty funny. We're going to be right back with more questions. Sorry. Thanks. Um, We're back in Madison, on the campus of UW-Madison, with Sue Steinberg, who, among other things, helped found um, MTV. She's back on campus, uh, a grad. Another question, please. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Charlie. Uh, I'm a student here. Can you talk a little bit more about how your training in the journalism school kind of prepared you to enter into the business world uh, later in life? Good question. That's a very good question. Um, I don't know that it, I would call it training so much as I would call it the um, wide open experience of being in the journalism school because one of the reasons that I chose journalism, this department, this school, is because it forced you or encouraged you to go out and really have a liberal arts education. Take as much history, as much English literature, as much um, social, you know, humanities as you could possibly take. Because the point is, learning to write is one thing. Knowing what to write about, knowing what what to say about different. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to really put this point into of view. the point of view. 
um, you know, having some background on any subject. You know, anybody can ask who, what, when, where, why. Right. But you have to be able to do your research, and research is really key. I think that's what this program taught just, me. Uh, um, I think liberal arts are good at um, not just developing knowledge, but at discerning intellect. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Where it, uh, Charlie Trotter's a UW grad. He's mm -hmm. a very famous right, American chef. Course. And he said, UW taught me how to think. I was just going to say, it teaches you how to think. It really did. That, that's what it... I mean, when people say, well, I didn't go to college, but, you know, maybe tradespeople, um, but I've been very successful anyway, I don't see it that way. I think education is something that you do for education's sake, mm -hmm. that you seek out for education's sake, and how you choose to move through the world with that knowledge is up to you. Another question. Hi, my name is Steve, uh, also an under undergrad I feel here. a little bit like I'm on inside the actor's studio. I know, it is. <laughs> right. It's like, right. If, I, if you're saying I'm that host, uh, we got a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> I know. I'm not a fan What's either. What's his name? I can't James remember. James Lippman. Yeah, James yeah. Lippman. Oh, I'm my uh, God. Yeah, I'll have a stack. Of, I'm sorry. I'll be <laughs> unctuous for the rest of the day. Go ahead. I'm curious. What do you think it was about you that allowed you to be on the edge of creativity, such a revolutionary in the cable television industry? Was it you know, just right place, right time, or something in your formative years, or being here in Madison, or maybe something else? All of the above. I think that um, I'm an only child, and I think it's kind of started there. My mother had a great creative sensibility. She uh, introduced me to music and the arts and culture at a, when I was at a very young age. Um, my father was a businessman, and, you know, together they gave me a little bit of both, a lot of both. I think that um, just playing out uh, chutzpah is what I had plenty of, moxie. Um, some of it is right place, right time, and I was willing to be open to experiences that were, uh, I don't want to say unorthodox, but were not on the straight and narrow path. When I started in the cable television business, you know, it was a job. It seemed interesting. People told me that it was going to be something big, and I just said, "Okay, let's 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 try it out. Let's go with this." Um, here's a piece. Offer some advice to to students and younger viewers. It's a talent to know when you're in the right place and the right time. Yes, it is. Um, you know, um, dumb luck will visit everyone, but not everyone knows they've stumbled into dumb luck. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And and your decision to go with MTV, you had there was intuition, there was some experience. How do you advise students to say to know when an opportunity is upon them? Because that's a gift. That is definitely a gift, and I'm not certain that that's something that can be passed on. How do you parse that, though? I, I mean, think that um, I'm sorry. I well, no, but how do you? I mean, how did you make the decision to go with MTV? Well, I thought that, um, first of all, at the time, this is interesting, I was offered a job on, at the, on the David Letterman show. And, um, Boy, there'd be a great follow-up question to that right I, now. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. And um, I have known him at times in the past. And, um, you know, he's a great talent. Yeah. And the show has obviously been very successful. Right. But I thought at the time that... Um, I wanted to be, I wanted to look more toward the future. However, I had no idea if MTV was going to be something right. or be nothing. I think what you have to convince yourself and believe in is that you cannot fail. You just, it's not an option. Right. And that if you're going to take this on, this business will be successful. And there's, we're going to come back, mm -hmm. but there's also a risk reward thing. Oh, you yeah. know, the bigger the risk, the bigger the flip. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be right back and we're going to take some more questions. We'll be right back. We're in Madison. For more than 100 years, the University of Wisconsin has been inspired by the Wisconsin idea. Which says the good work of the university extends to the boundaries of the state and beyond. So the UW works hard to help build Wisconsin's economy. Educate people of all ages. Advance health and medicine. And enhance the quality of life for all. The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. This program is a production of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you have comments about this broadcast, please email them to programming at uc.wisc.edu. Hi, we're back with Sue Steinberger, final seg. It's really been fun talking with you. Rat-a-tat-tat -tat MTV now, okay? 
Do you have a favorite video that ran on MTV? A little Thriller. Thriller? Mm -hmm. Favorite band that MTV broke? A favorite? Uh, no, I don't have a favorite. Favorite band that you worked with on MTV? I would say Dire Straits. Okay. It was a great, ba a, a great band that I enjoyed working with. Um, I think that there were some great women rock and rollers. Pat Benatar was Pat big. Pat Benatar was big. Joan Jett. You mm -hmm. know, these are women who really busted Chrissy a move. Hine. Yeah. Ex oh, Chrissy Hine, who I still love. Yeah. Right. Um, we were talking in the break. There were some bands that didn't quite get the MTV thing, mm -hmm. who were big at the time. They point often to Journey, Styx, Ario Speedwagon, who were very big arena bands then, but couldn't translate their music in an artistic way to MTV. Uh, do you think that's a fair assessment? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think that the audience for those bands, to a greater than lesser degree, didn't really need all that artistic, uh, all that artistry. Mm -hmm. I think that they just wanted to hear their band hard and loud. Right. And that that was enough, you right. know. They were bar bands. Exactly. They yeah. were bar bands, garage bands, right. who grew up to be, um, you know, arena bands. And never pretended to be Spandau Ballet. No, exactly. You yeah. know, there were no, um, you know, there were some certainly costumes. Um, I think, though, of those bands and of that type of music, certainly Kiss yeah. was a, you know, unique yeah. presence. So that was artistry without really talent. Exactly. <laughs> well, then there's that. But, um, uh, I'll say, leave that to right. you know the um, listener. So, do you ever run into any badgers in the business? Um, you know, there, it, it's actually um, there are quite a few folks who are in Madison. A lot. Who are out there, and it's not because we had monstrously great film schools or, but. My opinion, I don't know if you agree, it was an interesting culture here that lent itself to people going to Hollywood and New York in, in the media and in show business. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Excuse me. I think that the culture here um, was really all about expanding, seeking. You know, we were a seeking generation. We were seekers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people went to Hollywood and people went to all parts of the world for all kinds of reasons. Um, Peace Corps from, you know, Hollywood to Peace Corps. Right. Um, and so much in between. Yeah. And uh, do I, yes, I did run into a lot of people. And um, they're all, you know, Madisonians have made a good show in Hollywood. Yeah, that's been my yeah, impression as well. Absolutely. Um, so what are you going to do next? Well, I just fil finished building a house. Yeah. And that's probably the hardest job I've ever done in my life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought MTV was 24-7. Yeah. This was really 24-7. Yeah. So I'm going to relax a bit. Yeah. And um, I think that there are a lot of options for me, which is a great feeling. Right. I think that we talked about it before, a genera generate from a, the standpoint of being a certain generation and a certain age, it's time for the give back. Yeah. And uh, I think I've found the give back that uh, appeals to me. I've gotten involved with the Fresh Air Fund. Sure. And um, I think beyond that, uh, I'm very involved with the arts. And, um, you know, I'm interested in po politics, plays a big role in my life. Which is a heritage of your time in Madison to a certain oh, extent, absolutely, I would think. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. It was goodbye. a pleasure to be go here. Go rock around campus. Thank you. you. Know, go have a Plaza Burger. I will. And uh, thanks for joining us. And bravo. What a great run you've had thus far. Thank Sue you. Steinberg, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back in Madison uh, later. Come join us again. See everybody on Wisconsin. The preceding program was produced by the University of Wisconsin in association with the Big Ten Network.